3 says of him, he was the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Well, Paul was arrested for his preaching. He was taken through a series of trials. And finally, he used his Roman citizenship to appeal to the highest court, which was to stand before Caesar Nero in those days and to make his case. And so they began to ship him from the Middle East off to Rome, where his case could be heard. And as we've read, he was committed to a centurion, a Roman army officer named Julius of the Augustan Regiment. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we uh, also see so many marks in this passage of historicity. That is, it bears the hallmarks of being real history. These were actual historical events that happened. Now, Paul was delivered to this soldier, by the soldier and his troops, to a ship at Andromedium, we read there in verse 2. And this was a famous harbor in the ancient world, and it's been excavated, and uh, the archaeologists know about it. So we read about these many different things. In fact, there's various historians that have looked at this passage and have noted that it makes remarkable reference to the geographical and to the maritime features of that part of the world. There was a man named James Smith, in fact, who wrote an entire book in the 19th century about this voyage of Paul and how it matches up with a voyage that one would take in that part of the world. And that all the geographical notes in this, all the place names and everything else are accurate, both in where they're physically located and in the history of the time. And so once again, we see that the Bible doesn't err. The Bible doesn't have mistakes. The Bible is God's word, and it gives us true history. Now, happily, Paul was accompanied by a good friend in verse 2. We read about Aristarchus, a Macedonian, who is mentioned first back in chapter 19 of the book of Acts, or maybe 18 it is. I think it's 19, though. You can look that up. And he's mentioned a few times in the epistles as well. He was one of those converts from Thessalonica. And you've been studying Thessalonians in your Wednesday night uh, Bible study. So you know all about those dear saints who had a wonderful testimony. Paul said, we don't need to preach the gospel in your area because from you it sounded out like a trumpet. And so Aristarchus, this Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with Paul. And verse 3, the next day we landed at Sidon. That's another famous city in the Bible, the area from whence Jezebel came from in the book of 1 Kings, and a city of the Phoenicians who were a great seafaring people. So all of this is not surprising, but we see God's kindness to Paul. Look at verse 3. It says, Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Now, obviously, he's not being treated like public enemy number one. Julius can see he's not a dangerous criminal, nor is he a flight risk. He's not going to run away. And so he gives him certain liberty there to go to his friends and receive care. Well, you might say, what friends? Who could Paul possibly know in the territory of Phoenicia? Well, the book of Acts is wonderful in that it shows us what a great big body the body of Christ is. And if you're not part of the body of Christ, I feel sorry for you. You miss out on so much encouragement and so much help because the body of Christ, also known as the church, is composed of people who've been born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the body ministers to itself in love, the Bible says. We get these wonderful descriptions in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 of the body with its various parts, just like the organs of our physical body work together to minister to the health and good of the whole body. So the different individual believers work together in the church to minister to each other, to use the gifts that God has given them and to work in each other's lives. And so all the way along on this journey, right into the next chapter, when Paul gets to Rome, he's finding believers and believers are receiving him and believers are showing him hospitality. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a great hallmark of true Christianity 
when Christians show their practical love one to another through hospitality. And so they go from there in verse 4, when we put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And you get the sense as you read these verses that it was slow going for them. They're pushing against the wind. They're trying to find a fair wind. They're trying to use the leeward side of the islands to shelter them as they sail along. And doesn't that just remind us of our lives sometimes? That sometimes it seems like we're making very little headway. Our progress is greatly hindered. We might feel that way in spiritual things. We might feel like our growth is very slow growth. But if you're a believer in Christ, what a wonderful thing it is to know that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. So the Lord's not going to scrap you. He's not going to finish the job halfway through. If you're a believer, as one of our hymns says, the work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength shall complete. His promise is yea and amen and never was forfeited yet. Yes, I to the end shall endure, as sure as the earnest is given, more happy, but not more secure, the souls of the blessed in heaven. What a wonderful security the believer has in Christ. But you say, yes, I know about that, Keith. I know that that inexorable spiritual progress will happen. That eternal life that the believer possesses is organic. It's a growing thing. It's a living thing. Our relationship with the Lord grows as we spend time in the word of God, as we pray with him, as we go through life's journey and we face trials and tribulations, as well as the good things of life. We get to walk with the Lord Jesus like Enoch walked with God. And we wait for the day when the Lord will descend from heaven with the assembling shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God to catch us up to be with him in the air. But you say, many times my physical progress is also hindered. Many times I run into problems and difficulties. There are storms that hit me in life and they batter me. Well, Paul knew all about that, not just physical storms, but also spiritual opposition and also very pragmatic hindrances in his daily life. And yet there they were sailing on. Now, like many of us today, in fact, I, most, if not all of us, are to some degree subject to the dictates and the will of others. The government makes certain demands on us that we must obey. And there's certain demands employers can put on us or school teachers can put on us and administrators. We have people that can curtail our activities or that can determine when and where we can go someplace or cannot go someplace. And Paul certainly knew what that was about. Look at verse 9. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. Now we're talking about the fall. We're getting well into October and it's that time when you know June through November in your part of the world is hurricane season. And same thing with them. That part of the world late autumn, mid to late autumn is very dangerous for sailors. The Bible explicitly says it was dangerous because the fast was over. And Paul advised them, verse 10, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Now, the word he uses for perceive there is the word from which we derive theoretical or to theorize or a theory. It has the idea of coming to a conclusion based on careful and close observation. And so Paul had been looking at things and considering things. And he said, you know, this is a bad move. We really shouldn't leave this place. But Paul was one as an apostle of Christ, who also was a prophet, who also had the Lord revealing things to him. So it's quite possible that already the Lord had begun to give him an inkling of what was to come. Paul didn't know the future perfectly and didn't know all the details, but he knew this wasn't the right thing to do or a good thing to do. He knew this would be very perilous. And yet, verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman. That's the guy who is the pilot, the driver of the ship. He determines where they're going to go, where they're going to navigate, 
and ultimately the safety of the ship. And the owner of the ship, he was on board as well, probably making sure that his cargo of wheat got sold for a good price when they got to their destination. But they were not persuaded. Uh, they weren't persuaded by Paul. The people on the ship, the Roman soldiers, were more persuaded by the helmsman and by the owner of the ship. After all, one would say these must be the experts. These are the men who know about maritime affairs. They know about sailing. They know about these waters. What do you know, Paul? You're just a Christian. You're just a preacher. And you know, many times in the world today, we run up against people who claim to be experts in one field or another, and they most often are. They might be scientists or philosophers or other kinds of scholars, and they presume to tell people all about life and how it will end. Well, I want to tell you, friends, with all due respect to the experts, God gives us a brain, and God wants us to use the brain we have for the glory of God. Whatever capacity he's given to us, he wants us to develop it to the maximum, to the glory of God. Paul himself was an exceedingly brilliant man. He was a multilingual, very well-educated man with the equivalent of multiple doctor's degrees. He was a very smart individual. And the experts here were saying, no, no, we discount what you're saying. Now, if the experts talking about their field, I'm willing to listen. But when we talk about where the world has come from and where the world is headed, that is something that is very clearly beyond the purview of science. That is clearly something that goes beyond what philosophers can know because science means knowledge. The very word means knowledge and it's based on observation and things that one may test. It is empirically verified, therefore. And a scientist was never around to observe the creation of the world. They can see certain things about the universe and they can make deductions about the creation of the world. But if we really want to know where the world came from, we have to go to the Bible. We must go to this book, God's Word, because the creator of all things tells us where the world came from and where it's headed. Just like he was indicating through Paul where this ship was headed, and yet the experts wouldn't listen. Wouldn't it be an awful thing if because of our pride, because we thought we had so much self-awareness and so much personal knowledge, that we would discount the word of the one who has all treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden within him. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7 reminds us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, that's where we come to understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall make straight thy paths. Well, I'll tell you folks that these people on board this ship were going to have a most circuitous path because they weren't listening to God. And that's how life goes. When you don't listen to God, when you don't seek his will, you end up in some crazy twisting, turning roads. You end up sometimes in alleys that are blind alleys. You hit a dead end. Now what we have to do is repent and turn to God to get on the right road. After all, the Lord Jesus said it ultimately boils down to two roads and two destinies. You're either on the broad road that leads to destruction. You don't need to do anything to get on that road, friend. You're on it. You're condemned already, the Bible says, because anyone who is not in Christ, anyone who doesn't have a living relationship by faith with the Lord Jesus Christ is condemned. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They're on their way to judgment. But wonderfully, the Lord Jesus, the judge of all the earth himself, came to be the Lamb of God who could save us from judgment. In other words, by giving himself as a sacrifice. Uh, it says that it's unable to start live video, so we are going to try again. Sorry, folks. Pause for technical difficulty if you can hear me. I think I got kicked off. 
keep the recorder running by all means. Am I still on? Yeah, I'm still on the internet. I just got kicked off. So it keeps cutting in and out, in and out a lot. So oh, okay. I think it's because of the hot. Do you guys have a hot spot? That's what we're using because because the, the Wi-Fi was terrible. Because the Wi-Fi during the breaking of bread, we couldn't even get through a whole song without it breaking up. Oh wow! wow. And so when we switched to our wa our Wi-Fi hotspot, yeah. then who do you have? Print. I have Verizon Visible. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'm on the Wi-Fi now. Which one? Ours? Yep. I don't. I, don't, I was gonna put our like. Okay, spot. let's do your hotspot. Okay. How long ago did you... Um, probably like three, two months ago. Okay. Okay. So it's Jason. Turn, turn yours on. Yeah. iPhone XR. Uh, I'm sorry. It looks great. It doesn't show what up. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it keeps the rest of us from freezing to death. Uh, I've got hotspot 81 CE. Is yeah, that it'll you? It'll be Jason's uh, iPhone XR. You'll see it. Hmm. No. no, not at the moment. We should have just stuck with the. Um, there it is! Zoom, ah. Zoom was, would have been a better option. Sorry. Nothing? You're not 81CE, definitely, right? <laughs> I don't see Jason anywhere. Nothing. I see Mosin, Spa, PW Services, and Boulevard, and my wife's phone. Man. Okay, let me turn it on. Do you have that spot? <laughs> what happened with the Wi-Fi here from, from the chapel? It'd be great just to do Zoom, like if we had like a link. Okay, I can get back on Zoom if you want. Yeah, with the same link from previously? Yeah. On Wednesday? Uh, well, the one for the Lord's Supper, would that work okay? The Lord's Supper? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. I'll, I'll tell him right now. Okay, sorry about this. You want to stick to the same, your, your hotspot? So yeah, phone. yeah, yeah. Why don't we do that? Because I'm telling you, the Wi-Fi is working terribly the okay. last few days. Right. Yeah, let me go over there now. Okay. Now it says can't connect to this network with yours. Here. Okay, now it's... Did you turn it off? No. Oh, man. It's still on. Turn it off and turn it on again. Okay. It's got one connection on okay. now. Yeah, I'm connected. Thank you. Is the recorder still running? Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay, everybody, can the technical people please give me a chat message through the Zoom session here to let me know you can see and hear me okay? Once they tell me I'm on, we'll get back to Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. Yes, I'm good. Okay, good. So, as we've been saying, Paul has been on this difficult journey, this sea voyage, and I didn't intend a technical illustration this morning, but we're on a difficult journey this morning as well. Just keeping the tech moving sometimes is a challenge, isn't it? And this is a great indicator of what it's like in this world, that we face difficulties and hindrances of one sort and another. And yet, Paul was there trying to exhort those around him to take heed to what was going to happen. And we'll see that becomes an increasingly Godward message. Now, Paul advised them that this was going to be a perilous voyage and they should stay there. But they discounted that. They said, no, there's a better harbor. 
called Phoenix in verse 12. Not Arizona, you'd be hard pressed to find oceanfront property in Phoenix, Arizona. This is obviously another Phoenix named after that bird that came to life again. And they wanted to go to this harbor of Crete called Phoenix because it was a better harbor. Probably had better seafood restaurants, better hotels, you name it. Kind of like the Pembroke Pines of its day, I suppose. But anyway, they started out to go and initially it seemed like things were going well. Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. Now at first things seemed to go well, and that's how it is. Life in this world, so many people think, oh, it's going well for me, everything's okay. Sometimes life seems pretty smooth. Sometimes it seems like it's coming up roses. Sometimes we seem to not really struggle. And there are certain people, even though they live a life that doesn't please the Lord, they live an ungodly life, it seems like everything they do prospers in this world. Psalm 73 talks about that phenomenon. And the writer that the Holy Spirit used there, Asaph, complained to the Lord about it. How is it that the ungodly seem to have such easy lives? But then when he gets to verse 17 in Psalm 73, he says, Then I went into the sanctuary and I considered their end. And so you have to look at it from the eternal perspective. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? but loses his own soul. It doesn't matter how seemingly problem-free your pathway is in this planet, and no one has a problem-free pathway, but some appear to have it easier than others. But the question is, friend, how is going to be your eternity? Where are you going to arrive? What destination are you heading to? Are you on that broad road that leads to destruction, or are you on the narrow way that leads to life? The Lord Jesus said, He's the door. If any man by him enter in, he will have eternal life. And that's the way to go. You've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I've been walking my own way. But I can say with Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we have to say, Lord, I've been wrong. We need to repent. To look at our sin and not only confess that we're sinners, but say, Lord, I want to be saved from that. I want to turn from my sin and I want to be saved from it to live a life for God, to be in a new relationship with you by faith in Christ. Now, if you cry out to the Lord, whoever you are, he can move you from the wrong road to the right one, from the broad road that leads to destruction to the narrow road that leads to life by the great saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him and he will save you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, uh, says the book of Acts chapter 16. Now, getting back to our voyage, they knew about storms, just like you in South Florida know about storms. You've had great hurricanes and they knew about storms. They even had a name for this wind that was blowing, Euroclidon. And it's sort of like when you watch the Weather Channel sometimes, They'll say, oh, there's a nor'easter coming in. In my part of the world, Pennsylvania, when we hear about a nor'easter coming, that's bad news. That's going to be severely inclement weather. It's not going to be good. So they were now in basically what we'd say a hurricane gale. And when the ship was caught, verse 15 says, and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. So they were hauling along a smaller boat, kind of like a lifeboat, and they had to actually haul that in on board and use cables to undergird the ship to keep the planks from coming apart. They'd wrap these cables around it. I don't know all of the mechanical procedure of that, but they began to take extreme measures to try and save the ship. And you notice fear enters in, in verse 17. Fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. 
They knew this was a dangerous area. The part of the Bahamas where I'm currently seeking to go is off the island of Eleuthera. Eleuthera is a long island, about 90, 92 miles long or so, very narrow. But right by that island is a stretch of reef called the Devil's Backbone. And for more than 400 years, it's been a place where ships have wrecked. In fact, a lot of the ancestral inhabitants of Spanish Wells, St. George's Key, as it's actually called on a map, a lot of the people that live in that community are descended from the Eleutheran adventurers, people that shipwrecked on the Devil's Backbone in the 1600s and ended up there in Eleuthera. They even have an area you can go and see called Preacher's Cave because there's a big rock formation that's like a natural pulpit and it has excellent acoustics. My family has visited it and with our friends we've sung hymns in there before. Great acoustics. It was sort of a makeshift church until they could build a proper building for the local church to meet in. But that area to this day is so dangerous, so treacherous, that you need a professional pilot to get on your ship and guide you through the devil's backbone, guide you past the dangerous reefs. And a few of my friends do that for a living. And it was the same in Paul's day that they knew this part of the sea was treacherous. We could run aground here and we could all perish. My friends, there's a lot of things in life that are treacherous. There's a lot of things that are dangerous. There's a lot of things that can kill you in this world. Right on Pines Boulevard every week, there are severe accidents. Sometimes people are killed. Or down at the ocean, there are people that go in there thinking they're just going to have a swim. And they don't come out. They drown. They have a heart attack. Something befalls them. Uh, of course, we know about COVID-19, but there are many other maladies that can happen to our physical bodies. We are actually very vulnerable. Even when we're at the pinnacle of health and strength, we have to realize what Daniel told King Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5. He said, The God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou hast not honored. So there was great danger there, but they got past the danger. We see behind this the providence of God protecting them. Now my time's almost gone officially, but I'm going to go a little longer because due to the technical difficulties, we were obviously delayed. So bear with me, we have about 10 minutes to go, just so you can recalibrate your mental clock. Verse 18 says, Because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. So they're throwing out anything non-essential, any equipment that they don't need. Look at their despair in verse 20. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Imagine that. They finally despaired. Even the professionals, the experts said, there's no hope for us. Sometimes you listen to the cosmologists and they say in this world, we've got to go to Mars. We've got to establish a colony on the moon or Mars or other planets. You say, why? Well, because planet Earth is doomed. They even have a doomsday clock. Well, indeed, planet Earth isn't going to be forever. Heaven and Earth shall pass away, said the Lord Jesus, but my word shall never pass away. But the wonderful thing is God doesn't pass away. He's immutable. He changes not, the Bible says. And he's going to work all things according to the counsel of his own will. And he's going to bring it to his appointed end. And when the Lord Jesus has finished all his plans and purposes for this planet, which culminates in his second coming to earth to reign and rule from Jerusalem over Israel and over all the nations of the earth for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20, our Lord will rule and reign and show us what the Lord always wanted for this planet, what the last Adam intends to do is what the first Adam singularly failed to do. He's going to complete all of God's purposes for this planet. Every covenant, every promise, every prophecy will be fulfilled. And yet after that, it's not the end. Then will come new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Or if you don't know the Lord, friend, then will come for you a lost eternity in the lake of fire. 
What an awful thing. Uh, if you leave this world without Christ, you'll go to hell. And that'll be a holding facility of sorts. And you'll come out to stand before the great white throne judgment and hear the Lord himself say, Depart from me, I never knew you, you who work iniquity. And then you'll be cast into the lake of fire because death and hell themselves are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And you will be there forever and forever. It's so unnecessary. It's not needed. There is hope. What is the hope? Well, the Bible tells us about the hope of his resurrection. We have hope if we know Christ. Because Christ has risen, so shall we rise. But now has Christ risen, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of those who sleep. And so we have hope in him. We know he's the resurrection and the life. We know if we believe in him, not only will we spiritually be born again, but physically he will raise our bodies and we will be forever with the Lord. Now at this point, Paul steps up and exercises his great ministry of hopeful encouragement. Look at verse 21. Then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now at first blush, that sounds like Paul saying, I'm Mr. Know-it-all. You know, if you had listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. That's not very helpful, is it? But that's not really what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, now listen, I'm trustworthy. You didn't listen to what I said before. You discounted my advice. But let me tell you, if you had to listen to me, things would be far different now. So listen to me now, verse 22. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, it makes me think of another sea voyage in the Bible, back in the book of Jonah. And God's servant in that terrible storm in Jonah chapter 1, unfortunately was not as faithful as Paul was. Jonah was sleeping. Jonah wasn't giving any hope to those around him. Even though Jonah knew why the storm had come, why they were in the storm, it was from the God, the creator of the earth and seas, he didn't give those men any way out. And those men actually initially showed more faith than he. Finally, he did testify that it was his God, the God of Israel, the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah as we know him, Lord all in capital letters. He was the one who sent the storm to get his servant to go where he wanted. And there were men on that ship, in spite of that unfaithful witness, Jonah, there were men that came to faith in the living God that day and were delivered from the storm. Now, far different Paul. Paul was a devoted believer. And Paul steps up at the right moment and he says, you know, the angel of the God whom I serve has told me that all's going to be well. We're going to get out of this because I am his. I belong to him. Isn't it wonderful that believers can say, I am bought with a price. I'm not my own. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. I belong to the Lord and the Lord is going to safely guide me home. I'm going to arrive at heaven. That isn't in doubt. One of our hymns says, and I hope by his good pleasure safely to arrive at home. That's exactly what the believer can say. By the pleasure of the Lord, by his immutable will, by his incontrovertible purposes, the believer in Christ will arrive in heaven for eternity. And we can take others with us. We exhort them. Look to God. Do not be afraid, says Paul. Because, uh, said the angel rather to Paul, because you must stand before Caesar. Paul, you've got more work for me to do. You've got to be a witness to me. I'm going to bring you through the storm. And even though we know eventually Paul would give his life as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that his time on earth was not ended until God finished his work in and through him. And it's the same thing we can say, that each day we're given, it's a day to live for God. It's a day to serve him. It's a day to know him better. It's a day to grow in him. And it's a day to witness to others. 
But look at what it says there in the second phrase of verse 24. Indeed, God has granted you all those who sell with you. Obviously, Paul had been praying for them. So God granted his request. You want these people to be saved through the storm? All right, God says they'll be saved. And you know, everybody on the ship was saved from this catastrophe. But he says we must run aground on a certain island. I wonder, are we praying for those with us? Are we praying for those in our family? Are we praying for those in our neighborhood? Are we praying for our co-workers and fellow students? Whatever stage of life you're at, if you're a believer, it is incumbent on you. It's your sworn duty to tell others about the Lord Jesus and to pray that they receive him, to come along with you and be saved from the tremendous peril they're in. Well, as they go on through the story, they get closer and closer. And uh, certain people decide that they want to get out of the boat in that lifeboat. Some of the soldiers, uh, or some of the sailors rather, want to get out in that lifeboat. And Paul says, unless these remain in the ship, you cannot be saved, verse 31. Now, it could be that he was saying, we need those sailors' skill to help us navigate the ship into the island where we're going to run aground. Uh, it may be as simple as that. But I think it was also this. God was shutting them up to a scenario where it would be evident afterwards that deliverance had come by one way only. They had to believe the word of God through his servant. They had to listen to the good news they heard from Paul and believe that in order to be saved. This wasn't going to be a mixture of human effort saving them and God's work saving them. Salvation is never like that. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what Jonah said in Jonah 2. And Romans 10 reiterates that sentiment. It's by the Lord we're saved. We can't save ourselves, nor can we help him save us. Now, Paul, in verse 33, encourages them. Today's the 14th day. You've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. So he listened to the word of God himself and believed it. And he said, you know, since God is going to deliver us, you've got to keep up your strength. You've got to keep eating. You've been too busy and harried and worried to eat anything. Now eat. And he took bread and he gave thanks to God, verse 35 says. It reminds us of our Lord Jesus so often taking bread and blessing it. How he did when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. How he did when he fed 4,000 plus women and children. How he did on the night in which he was betrayed at the Last Supper. When he instituted the Lord's Supper. And he said, take eat, this is my body given for you. Not his literal body, but a symbol of that sacrifice that he was going to make on the next day. And that cup that spoke of the new covenant that he was making with his people. And so they were all encouraged, verse 36, and they took food themselves. And there were in all 276 people on the ship. Now there was one last deliverance when they were just coming in to within reach of the island where they would run aground. And the ship beached itself and it started to be pummeled by the waves and break apart. The soldiers said, let's kill the prisoners so no one gets away. But the centurion wanted to save Paul. You see, this is like so many times in the Bible when God gives his people good favor in the eyes of some authority. And we need to pray for that in these difficult days. That the authority would look on us well and would grant us the freedom to serve the Lord openly. But if they turn against us, we remember what the Bible says, we must obey God rather than men. Now the centurion wanted to save Paul, verse 43 says, so he commanded that those who could swim would jump overboard and some would float on pieces of wood and they'd all get to land safely. Well, that's how it goes in this voyage. Though there were great dangers, God's servant is brought through safely. God is able to protect his people and he's able to deliver. And through Paul, he providentially delivered this entire ship. I wonder how many of those people trusted in the living God that day? How many came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because they saw this amazing rescue that the God of heaven wrought for them? And I wonder if there's someone listening today. Maybe you're in the chapel building. Maybe you're listening virtually. Maybe you're hearing it on recording later. 
and God's speaking to your heart and he wants to deliver you from your sins and the wrath your sins deserve, from God's righteous judgment against what you are and what you've done. And you want eternal life. You want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You want to be with him in heaven forever. Well, the Lord says, call on me and I will save you. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Indeed, I think probably many trusted in the living God there that day. But we can say God preserved and encouraged his servant. And many of you believers are discouraged today, perhaps. You look at the hindrances, you look at the problems, you look at the storms that are hitting your life right now. Well, you have to look above the storm, dear brother, dear sister. You have to look to the God who is over all the storms. The one, as the disciples learned earlier, who even the wind and the seas obey him. He can speak the word and make a great calm. And in an instant, he can stop the storms. He can stop the severe tribulations. And you know, one day in an instant, he's going to do that when he comes to receive us to himself. That day might be today. And so look up, your redemption draws nigh, dear child of God. Look to the Lord who can carry you through the storm and who can encourage and strengthen you. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for thy word. We just pray that in spite of the technical disruption that it would sound forth loud and clear and that thy people would be encouraged at the sovereign God who delivers us in the storms of life and also for any that are lost, young or old, Father, who are listening that they would be convicted of their sin and their need of the Savior, that they can never weather the storm by themselves. They can't escape by their own efforts or their own knowledge and wisdom. Indeed, they need to throw themselves on the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We know there's mercy with the Lord because he died for our sins on the cross and rose again for our justification. So we pray that they might go to him today. We ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. And for his glory. Amen.